Thank you very much for the invitation. And yes, so today I will talk about translating preclinical models of ketamine action to human computational neuroscience. Um, as we all know, previous rodent models suggested that ke injecting ketamine directly into the lateral habenula attenuates the burst firing of these neurons associated with analogs of depressive behaviors in mice. Uh, probably cognitively and computationally, some of the most notable works done on the function of the lateral habenula was done by Matsumoto and Hikosaka using monkey neurophysiology, indicating a central role for habenula as, a, as an important um, hub for aversive learning. Um, in humans, the seminal work um, in this area was done by Rebecca Lawson and colleagues using a Pavlovian learning task um, in which uh, participants received electric pain probabilistically, and they suggested that habenula encodes the expected values of aversive outcomes, such as receiving electric pain. So in our study, we used this Pavlovian learning task um, to probe human habenula and to understand how a ketamine modulates this activity, uh, but also with a view to translate um, this rodent model put forward by a Yang et al. Um, study published, by, uh, published in Nature. Um, so we randomized um, 70 participants he healthy without any psychiatric um, history into ketamine versus placebo groups in a one-to-one -one ratio. Um, 24 hours after the infusion, participants um, did the Pavlovian learning task inside the 7 Tesla MRI scanner. And approximately half an hour later, um, we um, give them a behavioral assessment in the form of a preference test where they, they see random combinations of all the shapes they have learned um, in the task, and they declare their preferences between these shapes. So this is the outline of the Pavlovian learning task. Um, essentially, this is observational learning without any behavioral input. Um, participants basically were asked to learn the Somehow it doesn't work. Participants were asked to learn the um, associations between these abstract fractals, um, these abstract fractals, and four different types of outcomes, winning or losing money, um, in neutral shape with 100% of the time null outcomes and shapes which give electric pain probabilistically. Because the Pavlovian learning does not have any behavioral input, essentially we are dragging these participants along an effective environment in which they are observing events but they do not necessarily have any control over the outcome. So we wanted to make sure that the people were um, paying adequate attention to the task. So 20% of the trials had these red flickers um, to which the participants needed to um, respond with a button press as quickly as possible. Because the Pavlovian learning does not have any behavioral input, the modeling participants' expectations here is a little bit tricky. So in their previous work, Rebecca Lawson and colleagues used arbitrarily assigned learning rates in a Riscola Wagner model, and they reported that they tried a number of um, different learning rate values, which did not seem to affect their results. But because we don't know whether ketamine influence um, reinforcement learning, um, that, that approach becomes a little bit more tricky. So instead, what we did is we used the beta distribution update rule. Essentially, on trial one, participants would be indifferent to the um, shape probability, so their expected value of a um, shock outcome, for example, would be 50%. But from there on, with every observation, um, they would be updating these estimates, for example, after receiving a shock or observing a no-shock outcome. And in riscola wagner terms, even we wanted to circumvent these kind of problems, the nearest equivalent lear learning rate to this approach would be 0.124. Um, but due to the uh, pharmacological nature of this study, it's always better to bring in as much data-driven approach as possible so that we can have a more rigorous MRI modeling. And what we did here is that we convolved this expected value signal with participants' uh, perceptions of the valence of these shapes. For example, initially, participants would be completely indifferent between the, these shape categories, so their preference would be 25% across the board. But through learning, they would come to understand that the wind shapes were the most desirable and the shock shapes would be the most aversive. So our MRI regressor had both of these elements such that we were able to scale these expectations um, from the most appetitive to most aversive. 
So the regions which were co um, positively correlated with this um, regressor was the dorsal aspect of cerebellum and medial temporal gyrus, but we were more interested in the regions which were negatively correlated with that regressor because that's the kind of relationship we should probe habenula. So there we see robust activities in the insula bilaterally, but also in habenula bilaterally as we anticipated. What we then did is uh, we manually segmented habenula from uh, participants' structural images and we used these ROIs to extract the signal from that region. And this subsequent analysis um, suggests the main effects of um, ketamine attenuating the um, habenula signal to expectations of aversive events. Um, inside the scanner, the ketamine group displayed a slight procognitive effect in the sense that they were quicker to respond to the flickers, but this wasn't something significantly different between the groups. Outside the scanner, in the preference test, the ketamine group displayed a stronger preference for the 80% shock shapes, which would be the most aversive stimuli in that environment, and otherwise their um, reaction times in the preference test was comparable. Because the behavioral results and then the habenula signal um, displayed somewhat similar pattern, we thought these two might be related. And we did a correlation analysis, which suggests a negative correlation, indicating that higher the habenula response, the lower the uh, preference for the 80% shock shapes would be. So in summary, I think our study provides a successful translation of an influential preclinical um, mouse model to human computational neuroscience. I think we provide a clear uh, role for habenula in aversive learning such that silencing this activity with ketamine inadvertently improves preference for negative memories. Um, in my opinion, the study also um, suggests a feed-forward effect of ketamine, which can make patients with depression more resilient to negative events, but maybe not work directly on the negative memories which already exist. But we've done another study in which um, all the learning happened before the ketamine infusion. So hand in hand, these two, two studies will give us the complete picture. Thank you very much for listening, and I'd like to take your questions. Thank you. We may have some time for one question. Please, uh, wait for the microphone one second. <laughs> so, sorry, I cannot hear. Sorry. Uh, good talk. Uh, uh, you enjoyed the uh, administer the ketamine systematically, right? Have you ever think about uh, the way to specifically uh, get ketamine to habinula to uh, test your theory? No, it was an in, uh, intravenous in, in infusion um, the day before, so we did not do anything specific to deliver it to habinula. I think the question was, why don't you stick the ketamine straight into the herbanula using some new technology? Uh, um, yeah, that, yeah. Maybe, maybe that, for the next that's, one. That, yeah. That's tricky. <laughs> um, so, um, all right. So I think in the interest of time, maybe we can wrap the section half and 